Okay. Sweet by and by. There's a land that is fairer than day, and by faith we can see it afar, for the Father waits over the way to prepare us a dwelling place there. In the sweet by and by, we shall meet on that beautiful shore. In the sweet by and by, we shall meet on that beautiful Beautiful Bountiful Father above, we will offer a tribute of praise for the glorious gift of His love and His blessings that have no our day. Sing with me. In the sweet by and by, we shall meet on that beautiful shore. In the sweet by and by, we shall meet. That beautiful shore. Thank you. Good evening. I'm happy that everyone was able to stay longer this evening. And welcome to our online viewers again. Welcome back. And I um, hope that everyone has been felt blessed this day, this Sabbath day, to be able to learn something new. Maybe there's something out there that we thought we knew, but we learned something new to apply in our homes. And so I'd like to uh, invite Tom and Lane Waters back up as we start our next session. to pray. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for this evening. Thank you for the families that were able to stay. Thank you for the ones that are watching live, and thank you for the ones that will watch live later. Thank you for the opportunity to be able to record this and to be able to reach other families out there, those who are really seeking you, those who really have questions on how can we help our family? How can we help our marriage? How can we reach our children that are no longer living in the home, that are adults? How can you work in our lives and use us? And so I thank you so much for people that you use, Father, 
And so I ask for your presence to be here. I ask that you please use Tom and Elaine to, to teach us and to um, have your word spoken to us. And so I pray this all in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, welcome back to the afternoon session. That was a wonderful lunch. Thank you for any and all of you who participated in making that beautiful meal. We enjoyed it, and I didn't eat too much, so <laughs> that's a good thing. How about you, dear? How'd you do? I did great. I did great. It was fun, and the fellowship was wonderful, and we are thankful that you're staying with us this afternoon. Welcome back to those who are viewing on live stream this afternoon. We wish you would be here with us, but it's second best place, right? That's right. So um, we're going to be talking about parenting in this session by biblical principles, but we have a little introduction that we're going to need some help with. So I'm looking for a few children... Oh, I saw a hand go up. I saw some hands go up. Who would like to help? Let's see. There's one, two, three, let's four, see if five, let's make sure we get six, some new seven, people that eight, didn't get to nine. do it this morning. If there's any new people. How about those girls right there? Okay. Here's what we're going to do, children. You decide if you want to come help us. Have you ever heard of Follow the Leader? Yes. 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 Is it fun? Have you played it? Yes. Well, we're going to invite you up. You can come up here. We need all your help, okay? Girls, if you want to come up, that's fine, too. Okay, so children, we're going to be doing follow the leader. Do you understand? Let's wait till they get up here. Are we going to get the whole crowd? Okay. All right, I'm going to have you back up just a little bit. Actually, I'm going to come over here. Don't let me fall off of here, okay? That's yeah. your job. Don't let me fall off, okay? I'm kind of tall. I, I need to be shorter so that the... The live stream can see you, not so much me. There you go. Okay, that's better. And I don't have so far to fall if I fall down. Okay, children, now you're going to have to be very attentive. You know what that means? Pay attention. That means you have to look and listen to me and not talk. Can you all see me? Put the little ones in the front, the bigger ones in the back. Can we? Big ones in the back, little ones in the front. If, if you can't see me, that's not a good thing. So we're going to be playing follow the leader, okay? And so when we do follow the leader, whoa, got to listen. Now, let me explain what it means to listen. That means you don't talk while she talks, okay? Okay, good. So who's your leader? I am your leader. And if I'm your leader, what are you supposed to do if you're playing follow the leader? Pay attention and follow the leader. How are you doing? You doing pretty good at following the leader? Okay. All right. So, parents, I want you to pay attention over here. It's not just the kids, right? You, are you tracking with us? Okay. We're playing follow the leader. All right, children, I want you to put up your right hand. Everybody put up your right hand. Quickly put up your right hand. Children, children, put up your right hand. Okay. We can put them down. Now, children, what I'd like you to do, I'm going to have to put the mic down to do this. I want you to take your two fingers, and I want you to put them over your ears like this so you can't really hear good. Everybody got that? Okay. How you doing? Okay, you can take them off. What did I say? That's right. So they illustrated some points we want to make today, and they did a great job. So I would like to ask you children a question. Who is the leader that we should be following? Not just yeah. you children, Jesus. but those Jesus. children. Jesus. Jesus. And how do we follow Jesus? By, by obeying Christ. him. Through the Bible. Obeying him through the Bible. Praying. Through Christ. Through Christ. Worshiping, praying to him, right? Studying God's word. Should we be memorizing God's word? Yes. yes. Do you have memory verses you memorize? Yes. yes. And do you really memorize them? Yes. Good for you. Well, I would like my husband to get me this little box here. And I want to thank each of you for helping us with this illustration today. 
So in this box is a little Bible that has, we gave one out earlier today, but it has, you can hand them out, has a, a verse from every book of the Bible in here. And it is really amazing when this little book, this little Bible was put together, that the most amazing verses they put in here, including the entire Ten Commandments as God made it originally. No modifications. Now, pretty important, right? Well, I don't have a lot of black, so you may be stuck with white ones, okay? But children, this is so that you will be motivated to read and study and memorize God's word, okay? Okay? Okay. Thank you for helping us. Do you have a black one? No, I'm out of blacks. Okay. You can go sit down now. Thank you. <laughs> so here's parents, adults, and big kids out there. Did you notice anything about this illustration today? Thank you, children, for helping. You did a great job. So here's, the, here's what we want to start out this afternoon with, follow the leader. God is our ultimate leader, right? Who are the leaders in our homes? Mom and dad, right? So in this illustration, this experiment that your children helped us with, did you notice the very first thing I, I told them that I was their leader, right? What did I do that none of them did? I was talking like this follow the leader. They know that they're supposed to do what the leader does. But this leader did not tell them to put their hand on their hip. And this is a parenting style. We expect our children to do what's right because we do what's right. We expect them to follow us when we don't give them any clear instruction. We think by our example alone that that's sufficient to, the, to help their minds be tuned in and guide. At a young age, just being an example, right? Did you all see that hand on the hip? Did you notice that they, none of them were putting their hand on the hip? At least I didn't see any. And yet it was clear I was their leader. So what isn't clear to them is that there is not a strong message of what I'm saying and what I expect of them, right? This is a parenting style. We expect they will do what's right because it's right, not because we give instruction and model it. So the second thing that was illustrated here, if you were paying close attention, is that she asked everyone to raise their right hand. Which hand did she raise? Her left hand. Did you see how confusing that was to the children? How many of the children raised their right hand? About half. Because what gets confusing is when parents say one thing and do another. Let's say that one more time. We say one thing and we do another. Could that happen in parenting? How about this? We tell our children that they shouldn't argue and bicker with each other. And do they ever see mom and dad bicker with each other? <laughs> Would that be an example? So that's the second. If we do one thing or say one thing and do something different, we create confusion. Okay, the third example, and I think they did really great, because I never know how many children we're going to have up here and how old or how young or whatever. But the, the last thing that I asked the children to do was to take their fingers, and I went like this, and they all did that, at least most of them, and put them over their ears, right? So I gave clear instruction, and my example my instruction. Was there any confusion? Did they all do it? 
Yeah, and they were all clear. They were all happy. They all did it, and nobody took their hands away from their ears until I did. So they were following the leader. Uh -huh. So you children did an amazing job. Thank you for helping us, and that helps all of us as big kids to understand more clearly the importance of principled parenting according to the Word of God. That means that we need to teach and train by principle, precept, and example. You see this? We teach and train. You can teach a child how to do the dishes, but once you train them how to do the dishes, teaching and training work together. Just telling them, just instructing them is not enough. They need to be trained. And the more hands-on it is, the better the lesson is learned. So, if we want our children to be obedient, they need to learn what obedience means. I'm thinking of an example in our home where our children used to, in the early days, especially when it was just the two girls before our son Josiah came along, in the early days, they would get out all kinds of toys all over the place and go from one thing to another to another, okay? So, mother, particularly, because she was home during the day and I wasn't, she would tell them, you need to put your toys away. Well, then they're overwhelmed, so what did you do? So I recognize that when they get overwhelmed, that's a temptation for me to come impatient, right? Like, hurry up. Generally, we give our children instruction, and we busy ourselves, and we're tuned out. We don't follow through that they're following through with our instruction. And then when we come back, it's like nothing's happened, right? We are all relating to this, right? So I recognize that rather than telling them something to do and, and then having them or be, them being overwhelmed, I need to stay with it. And I said, from now on, it's one thing out at a time. When you finish with that toy, with that activity, that gets put away. With those books. With you done reading those books, that, those go away. They put back in the bookshelf where they belong. Then you get something else out. We're talking three and four year old training here. So it's not that you have to wait till they're seven or eight. You can start these expectations at a younger age. Part of the challenge we have as parents is we don't have clear expectations. We just kind of roll with the flow and then we try to come in and, and give some instruction, but then we get pulled back, we get preoccupied and busy, and we come back in and try to give some instruction. But we need to have clear expectation and really, especially in those formative years, we need to be intentional about staying with it, staying with them, making sure of the follow through. There's an interesting, Bible text here that we're going to start off with. It's found in Psalm 25, verses 4 and 5. It says, show me your ways, O Lord. So what's the first thing? Show me, okay. Show me your ways, O Lord. Teach me, teach me your paths. Lead me, ah, lead me in your truth and teach me. For you are the God of my salvation. So you see these action words that show me, it's teach example. me, lead me, teach me. So it's example, instruction, example, instruction, example, instruction. And they match. Like the last illustration, put your fingers over your ears. The instruction match the example. So this is very helpful for us as parents. And like Tom was saying, it was transformative in our home when all of a sudden, and it didn't happen overnight, but when I came in and said, I want you to put your toys away, that I stayed there to make sure it was happening. And I would even have to go over and take one of them by the hand and help them pick up the toy, take it across the room, put it in the toy box, and do that one or two times when they were young. That's what mommy wants you to do. And then encourage them when they do it, right? And so then they understand that, and then one thing out at a time. I tell you, one thing out of a time, and then put away, and then something else can come out and put away. What a relief that is. Because when uh, 
Modern science has done tons of studies, and one of the studies they did was what makes children hyperactive, one of the things. And it's because there's so many things out at once. Overstimulated. The, the child is overstimulated. They don't know what to do. So they do this, and they do that, and they do this, and they do that, and they're all over, and they never do anything completely. They never sit down and really build anything with the Legos or play with the matchbox cars. Or color the whole picture. Or color the whole pictures, page after page, a little bit here, next page, a little bit there. And children naturally do that. So it's our responsibility as parents to help them slow down, do something to completion, do something well, enjoy the activity, enjoy the toy, enjoy the play to a fuller measure. And that will strengthen their attention span. Isn't that amazing? They found when they put children in a chaotic setting, children were chaotic. They found if there was very loud and wild colors on the wall, children bounced. But if they had a soft color on the wall and there was one color and things were neat in the room and there was just one thing out and they could get it and they could put it back, children were calm. Children focused. Children played for a period of time with what was out. And I thought it was amazing that we're studying all this, and yet, when it comes to application and culture, it's just not there. It's just not there, and it's not happening. So in our parenting, we've made tons of mistakes, as every parent probably has or will. But we kept going back because we wanted the instruction from God's word. We wanted him to teach us how to raise our children to love and honor God. And we're going to share with you this afternoon one sentence. How many sentences? One. one. Is Actually that two? Is it two? I think it's only two one. Two sentences, one paragraph. Well, that, oh, yes. Sorry. Two sentences, one paragraph. Almost, one, Almost one. One, one, paragraph. one period <laughs> instead of a comma. I, I didn't have my glasses on. I read as a comma. Anyway, this one paragraph, two sentences, really became a foundational pillar in our home as we parented our children. Parents, by precept and example, should teach their children, what was that first word? Teach, teach. their children the love and the fear of God. Teach them to be intelligent. Teach them to be social, affectionate, to cultivate habits of industry, economy, and self-denial by giving their children love, sympathy, and encouragement in the home. Parents may provide for them a safe, and a welcome retreat from many of the world's temptations. Fundamentals of Christian Education, page 65. This is one paragraph. I want to tell you what all of us tend to do when we're zealous parents, when we're uh, sincere parents, when we want to do the best. We cover lots of material cover lots of material, and do not focus on simple application of one principle. This paragraph is loaded with life-changing material. Amen. And we literally began to take this paragraph and incorporate it into our everyday life, and it was Phenomenal. Almost unbelievable. Because we committed to take this principle and take this teaching and this cultivating and this giving. It's teaching them, it's cultivating in them, and then it's giving from us to them. This is God's picture for his children, for us. Mm -hmm. When we began to do this, it was, it was revolutionary. This is really God's parenting style right here. He first teaches us, then he cultivates, he gives, right? And all for the purpose, it said at the very beginning, to help our children learn to love and fear God. Is that the ultimate goal we have as parents, to love and fear God for our children? Absolutely, right? 
And so how, do, how does that happen? Now it's, it tells us how that's going to happen. And we're going to dissect this out today, OK? Is that OK? We're going to take a, a microscopic, or maybe not quite a microscopic, we're going to break it down into smaller fragments. We're going to make it practical. And, and make it very practical. So there's three areas we're going to be talking about, teaching, cultivating, and giving. And under each of those three are three things that we're going to talk about specifically, all for the purpose of helping our children learn to love and fear God. So we're going to start with number one. Teach. We're going to teach them. So we're going to teach them first how to be intelligent. Oh, how do you teach your children to be intelligent? <laughs> okay. That's more than academics, by the way. Yeah, this is not just an IQ test. How do we teach our children to be intelligent? So we're going to give you a very simple but very practical example of how we help them reason from cause to effect, from occurrence, which is causation, to consequence. Cause and effect. This one thing is so missing in parenting today. So we're going to give you a simple example. We're driving along in our vehicle. Back in the early days of Montana, we had a super cab pickup. That's one of these. You don't see them much today, but it was a Ford super cab with a bench seat in the back. So we could put our whole family of five in there with all the car seats. And that was our, that was our vehicle to get around. <laughs> and the, the front windows rolled down, but the back windows were winged. You know what I mean? They had that little thing they push out. So they only opened up a little bit. And our son, Josiah, was about 14 months old at that time, and he dearly loved his binky. You know what a binky is? You may have another term, but a pacifier. The plug, whatever you want to call it. <laughs> binky sounded nicer. <laughs> the plug was probably more practical. <laughs> but <laughs> So <clears throat> we're driving home after a, a town day, and he gets this thing out of his mouth, and he looks at it. And he gets our attention and makes noise. And I turn around, and he's kind of handling it like this. And I smile at him, and then he looks at me, and then he does this. He's sitting by that little winged window that was open, and he does this. And he looks at me. Then he gets his father's attention in the rearview mirror. He does this time and time again. like, And I said to him, if you drop that out the window, it's all gone. Now, he knew, the word, he knew the term all gone. It had some placement in his mind, right, even at that young age. Oh, yes, he knew. <laughs> and so he, he looked at me, and then he looked out the window, and he looked up front, and he saw his dad's eyes in the rearview mirror. And father said, if you drop it out the window, it's all gone. Parenting in harmony. That's important, right? We're going along, and I don't know, five, six minutes. He's, he's in this action. And all of a sudden, he lets it go. And he does this, trying to see out. And it's gone. And he's expecting, when he makes his noise, that he wants his binky, that we're going to stop the car, or stop the truck, and we're going to find that binky. But we didn't stop. We turned around. We said, honey, we told you when you let it go, it's all gone. Oh, what a simple lesson. Would you know it? We, he talked about uh, our greatest battle. Now, a binky for a child that age can be a big battle. But the devil wanted to make my, take mileage in that one. On the way home, we're 50 miles from the town where we shop to our rural setting in the mountains of Montana. On the way home, our vehicle broke down, our truck broke down on the side of the road. <laughs> so now we have no way to get home, and we have a child who's dearly missing his binky, and we have some groceries and things, and finally it worked out that we got back into Whitefish, Montana, and the first hotel we came to was actually a resort hotel because Whitefish is a big ski area. And we got in there, 
<laughs> they gave us a special deal, and a we, lost binky deal. <laughs> we told them of our circumstance because we just didn't have the money to pay a resort fee hotel. And anyway, they were very kind. They felt sorry for us. Here's a family of three little kids, a baby, and we're broken down on the side of the road. And so they're going to give us this great deal, and it was. I don't remember what it was, but we could actually afford it. And they gave us this room. Now it's time to go to bed. And guess what Josiah wants to go to sleep with? The yeah. Binky. Can I, give, can I give him the rendition? Yeah. Here's his rendition. I'll never forget this, unless I get Alzheimer's. Binky! 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 Did you get it? <laughs> this is desperate. And it gets louder. And it gets louder. And he goes into a full mourning wail <laughs> of death. <laughs> <laughs> and we know that she has an extra binky in her purse. Because every mother has more than one binky, <laughs> right? We, every, every child having a binky, they at least have a half a dozen, right? So now we're in our greatest battle, at least for the moment, <laughs> about binky or no binky. And all the people whose rooms are surrounding us, because you can hear the morning well down the hallway. And these are people who go to a resort. It's usually not a place you find like babies, you know. <laughs> They're on vacation. It's a kind of an adult resort. And this mournful cry and almost desperate plea of whatever. And my wife, you have to understand, my wife is, she doesn't like conflict. Not at all. With other people in other rooms that are hearing our kid <laughs> screaming in the night. And so she's, she's coming under deep temptation. Honey, you think we should get the other binky out? And I'm saying, no. We have to say what we mean and mean what we say. If he wins this one, we're in for some big battles. Do you get it, parents? Amen. You've won a few, you've lost a few. Because you don't win them all, okay? <laughs> you grow into winning, okay? <laughs> so, we won that battle that night. And it didn't, go on, it didn't go on all night. It was, no. it was a good hour or more. It seems, you know, when that's happening, it feels like an eternity, really, you know, if you had a screaming child. You don't want to go out the door the next morning, or you <laughs> hope you don't meet anybody in the hall that was next to you. <laughs> like, but it was such a powerful lesson, because he knew what we were saying, and he was testing us, wasn't he? How do we teach intelligence? cause to effect and i tell you he never from that evening when he stopped the tears never asked for another binky never looked back that was it not, not once and then of course you go home and you discover oh here's another one i better get that one in the trash can you know, before it sees it <laughs> but anyway it was it was quite a lesson so that's on a, a very young level but we we teach that all the way up through the adult life. We don't have time to give illustrations all, all of them, but let's go to the next thing we're supposed to teach, and that is how to be social. The best place to teach social skills is in the family. I know. Because you have various ages in the family. And even the extended family with the grandparents or cousins or uncles and aunts, tremendous way to teach social skills. The culture of the day says, put your child with children their age and let them be. They will become socialized. Yeah, you want to socialize them? Today's culture? So they're all socialized yeah. at, at, at a six-year-old level, right? Or a seven-year-old level. And so, it, you know, when we look at what's being pushed on us in culture, and we step back, and we just don't accept it, but we step back and take a broader look at it, we see that this doesn't make sense because God in his word talked, he created the family and he talked, he has a lot to talk about social skills, what's appropriate and what's not appropriate, right? But notice how he, how important the family was, the family nucleus was all through scripture, Old and New Testament, right? So we teach our children to be social in the home. They learn how to communicate with mother as an adult in a respectful way.
They learn how to talk to their younger siblings with kindness and respect. They learn how to approach their father and speak to daddy in a respectful way. And they see that we all work together and we, they can talk with little ones and older ones. And we had friends with older kids and younger kids. And it was amazing to see how they could get along. They didn't have to go with just their best friend who was their same age, and they had to do stuff together. And this group does stuff together, and that group does, you know what I mean? How we pair them off. And then it, they become very narrow in socialization skills. That's right. But when they play together, and we have a 12-year-old playing with three and five-year-olds, and an eight-year-old, and we're all playing the same thing, that's socialization. It, it's best opportunity, especially if mom and dad get in there. And now as grandparents, we continue that same thing. We're on the trampoline with the grandkids. We are socializing with them, even though there's a big age gap, and they love it. Yeah, I just want to emphasize this, especially in terms of what we shared this morning about Sabbath, making Sabbath a delight. One of the biggest breakthroughs we had as parents early on with our children was realizing that we needed to learn to socialize in family groups, not adult groups and child groups, okay? I told you earlier that in every church we've been in, and it was the same here, the children just tend to run with the children, and the parents do whatever they have to do in between Sabbath school and church or after the fellowship meal, whatever. It's just the way most of humanity operates. We made a commitment to the Lord and to our children that we would come home after the Sabbath service, and if we wanted to have a family, we would plan an activity in that little planner. We would plan an activity that was for both families together so that when the meal was over, because when I was growing up, and I, again, I told you I had a very loving family, but when the meal was over on Sabbath afternoon, my friends and I, we ran, and my parents had no idea what we were doing until we got in trouble. And back in those days, we got in trouble. And it was, you know, what are you doing this on the Sabbath day? Now, I didn't understand it, but as I look back, I could have said to them respectfully, what are you doing letting us do this on the Sabbath day? Now, I didn't think of that then, okay? But isn't that a, as parents, we need to realize that we need to be responsible for what's happening, not blame it on our kids and tell them, you shouldn't have been doing that on the Sabbath day. What's the matter with you? Okay? And so we started socializing as family groups so that when the meal was over, we had an activity planned, and the family friends that we invited from our church said, we've never had Sabbaths like this. Where did you get this idea? You know what we told them? We got it from the Lord, because we never got that idea from anybody else. So that socializing keeps a lot of heartache from happening. That's right. And these are, these are things we're supposed to teach. The third area we're supposed to teach is affection. Now, we have natural affection for our children, but this affection is more than just a hug and a kiss and that, that type. That's important. We need to be demonstrating that and giving that. But more importantly, we need to teach them that affection is thoughtfulness and courtesy and compassion. That means how they treat one another. Are they patient with one another? Do they ask nicely? Or does the younger one just take something from the older one and the older one grabs it back and then the younger one screams and then the older one gets in trouble? Who started that, that problem? The younger one. Who took it without permission? But the older one gets in trouble because they're supposed to know better. Well, what is that teaching the younger one? Get away with whatever. Get away with whatever. And it's inequity, and it's a problem. So teaching our children to be kind and courteous to one another in gentleness, how they speak to one another, how they interact with one another, learning how to control themselves. Those are all things we're supposed to teach. And now we need to talk about what we're supposed to cultivate. So cultivating is a very important thing. That's nurturing the crop, getting it to flourish, right? So cultivating... It said we need to cultivate habits. Cultivate what? Habits. Things that become habitual, okay? I mean, it just popped into my head when we said this. One of the things that we cultivate in our children is neatness and order. We were sharing with somebody last night here after the meeting, 
If you were to walk into our son, our, our baby, okay, he's 37 years old. If you were to walk into his apartment at any time where he lives, it was just a couple of months ago we walked in there and he said, let me show you what's, you know, what I've got here and, and he had gotten a new apartment and we walked in and I walked into his closet and I said, son, did you do this for us? This looks like a high-end store for selling clothing. He said, Father, this is what you guys taught us. This is what I do when nobody's looking. This is the way I live because this is a restful way to live. I just, that meant so much to me. Probably meant a lot more to, to his mother. Yeah. Let me tell you, it wasn't always that way. <laughs> I can tell you how many times when we had this, you know, neatness and order thing, and it was not a one-time conquered weakness, and now it's revolutionized. This is something we revisited over time, over a few years of time. But, you know, there were times, okay, everything looks good on the outside, but I happened to pull a drawer open, and it was just stuff, stuff, stuff. <laughs> not stuff that belonged in the drawer, it was just whatever was laying around quick. That's the easiest drawer to get it jammed into. Now, Mama, my room looks nice or what's under the bed, or open the closet door. We need to help our children in this, this habits of industry, so through their chores and regular duties. One of those habits of industry was orderliness in their own realm, their bedrooms they were responsible for. Again, we didn't start out this way. We came into this after we started studying the Word of God and were inspired to put away some of those great parenting books that were leading us to dead ends and discouragement, and we went to the Word of God and saw, wow, this is amazing. And you know who it had to start affecting first was me, because I was a stuffer too. I had my junk drawer, I had this, you know, I had my closet, everybody's coming to come with me. And there were literally a closet in the house that I would put stuff in and never open the door until I put more stuff in there. And it was terrible. So it addresses us as well, that orderliness, that regularity and the routines, our children learn how to do all of the chores in the home, washing dishes, making food, cleaning the house, washing their clothes, ironing the clothes. Yes, even our son had to iron the clothes. And they rotated every week, every week, every week there was a rotation. And it created such an atmosphere of security and calmness. There was no, oh, it's not my turn. I washed the dishes yesterday. Because we tried that and we, you know, children are going to be children. So that's important. And then we're also to cultivate economy. And for us, that meant we needed to start at this age here, as I'm looking at the children who are up here helping us, at this age, economy. Go to the grocery store. Go to a Walmart. Go anywhere. And what do you hear when you're heading for the checkout? I want this. I want that. They're hanging out of the basket grabbing, right? <laughs> uh, you know, you see that the parent child struggle here. No, you can't have it. I want it. They, no, you can't have it. The child gets louder. No, you can't have it. I want it. They hit the parent. I want it. And finally, the parent is so embarrassed, they get it, and they just got to get out of there. So economy is so important. So when our children were probably not early, I would say probably third, fourth, fifth grade in that range, okay, we decided, because we're implementing this one paragraph practically in our home, over time, I mean, continuing, right? This isn't a once, this is not just a one time in a week, do this and forevermore it's settled. This is implementing, going back, implementing. And when we read this about economy, we had this idea. We're gonna give each of our children $100. Now back in that day, that was quite a bit of money. And we told them, this is for you to manage. That means you buy, what you need and what you want. Your shirts, your underwear, your socks, your shoes, you know, those type of things. Because typically, parents, we buy this stuff for our children and they have no concept what it costs. They just see the newest pair of jeans, I want those jeans, and we get them for them. They do not know how to appreciate and, and understand economy. So this was the deal. You each get $100, you have to write it down like a ledger, 
And then when you buy something that you want and you think you must have and cannot live without, then you put that amount on that ledger and you subtract it from your $100 so you know how much you have left. Now that was great because this was also math class for a whole year. Practical math. It, it, this went on for years. <laughs> and it was amazing. And we told them at the end of the year, whatever money of that $100 you did not use is yours. No more accountability to us. And it wasn't meant to go out and buy toys. It was meant to buy basic need things. And all of our children had money at the end of every year, some more than others, but they all had something. And we could see them processing when they would go shopping and they saw this really nice pair of shoes. I remember once Josiah saw a pair of cowboy boots. We weren't even in Texas. But cowboy boots are pretty popular in Montana too. And he just wanted them so bad. Cowboy boots. I just got to have cowboy boots. Oh, mother, I, got, I said, honey, you know, you, have, you are responsible for this money. Now, these were a brand new pair. And I thought they were way overpriced, and they were. But anyway, he thought about that. And I said, so what, what is that going to do for the rest of the year? What if you want something else? Because you're going to spend a good portion, most of, that money on one pair of Almost shoes. Almost half. Yeah. And I could see him thinking, and then he finally said, Mother, can we go to the thrift store? I said, sure, we'll go to the thrift store. Went to the thrift store, and lo and behold, there was a used pair of cowboy boots there, just his size, and they were less than $4, and he was so happy. And he wore those boots until they, could ha they had nothing left to give. <laughs> and it was a lesson in economy. So fast forward after 20 years or 15 years of this, when our girls got married, they went into their married life not in debt, not with just a little bit. They went into married life with quite a substantial savings because they learned economy. Over $10,000. Oh, it was way more than that. I know, but I'm not trying to exaggerate. Okay. <laughs> and the other part of economy is God is always first. So... Out of, you know, out of that, you always give God his portion first. And that's very important because that's not being taught anymore. But economy is important. And then self-denial. Remember that we're, we're talking in this section about cultivating self-denial. So when we're talking about cultivating anything, this is not something that just happens one day, one week. This happens through the process of getting the crop ready for harvest. This is cultivating. So cultivating self-denial is way off of the culture we live in today. And since we're talking about this in the context of children in our homes as parents, today flying on airplanes, because we've been flying on airplanes for the last 34 years, and we've watched the culture of flying parents change. Do you know today what it's like? It's very common today to see people getting on. We had, we had a family that took the row in front of us, again, three and three, the row in front of us, and from the moment they sat down, their children learned nothing about self-denial. It was all about give me now. I want now. Give it to me now. Have you heard that? This is the culture we live in today, and the culture of parents today, and this is a tragedy. You hear me use this word quite often in terms of what's happening in culture today. The tragedy today is parents are trying to reach their child with every beck and call, every demand the parent is trying, desperately trying to to give it to the child, to shut them up, to quiet them down, to, to make them happy. Make them make happy. Does it make them happy? Yes or no? Oh, no? No. It makes them little tyrants. And this three-year-old sitting in front of us, she was sitting directly in front of me. And sometimes I just pray, oh, Lord, can I help? <laughs> Not unless you're asked. <laughs> <laughs> Calm down. <laughs> I tried to help 
Years and years ago, I learned a very valuable lesson on an airplane. I tried to help a desperate parent that I thought she would appreciate my help. She said, mind your own business, buddy. I've never done it again since then, <laughs> okay? But here's this three-year-old. We are literally sitting on the tarmac. Her parents can't get her to put her seatbelt on. Two parents. She's bigger than all of them in will. You understand? They said you have to put your seatbelt on. I don't want to. Direct quote. No. Finally, the lead flight attendant stood up and he said, you need to get her seatbelt on now. This plane won't this leave the plane ground. This plane will not leave the ground until she's in a seatbelt. So guess what the parents did? They blamed him. This man says you have to put your seatbelt on. We're too spineless to have you put it on. They didn't say that. That was just my add-in. He's telling us you have to put it on, so you have to put it on. And it's, then they went on to tell her to bribe her. If you put it on, we promise you can take it off as soon as the airplane's off the ground. Is that, is that the rules on the airline, people? No. The, the pilot, the, the captain, or the first officer will tell you when it's safe to take your seatbelt off. She had that seatbelt off before we were 50 feet off the ground. Okay? Now, this is, a, this is a live example. It just happened recently on the plane, but this is not an unusual example. Is this child being made happy? Literally, she is, she's a miserable tyrant. Is it her fault? No, not at three years old. So you may feel like a big breath of fresh air and sigh of relief that mine's not that bad. Well, just take inventory because if we are not cultivating this kind of self-denial, it's going the other direction. One of the things that uh, is very common is let the children go first. And it seems like that's kind of nice, but if the children are always used to being first, then they never learn to be last. And they never learn to let others go ahead of them. Right? So it's not that a child can never be first. When we talked last night, we talked about family fun time, and they only chose one day a week what they wanted to do because we had one in our family who would have chosen the activity every single day and been quite demanding that this is what we're going to play. But when we said, no, you need to let the others and mom and dad have a choice what we're going to do, this is all teaching that self-denial. Right. Others ahead of ourselves. Then the last thing this paragraph said is, We've instructed, we have, we're cultivating habits, now we need to give. And there's three things it says we need to give. The first one is love. And that seems natural. Pretty broad. Natural. Of course I love my children, right? No, but giving love means we give them our time. We give them energy. We give them intentionality. We give them enthusiasm. We take time to listen to them. We, we hear their hearts. And this giving love is more than just affection. It is the whole day looking for ways to reach into our child's heart that lets them know that we love them and that we're, we're interested in them, but we are still the lead or we are still the authority in the home. One of the ways that all of our adult children have shared with us multiple times is that your love was demonstrated that while you always had other people that needed your time, you always made time for us. And that was a choice that we made early on. We thank God for that. We made time, as we shared last night, five days a week, 30 minutes a day minimum to recreate with our children at every age level. The blessing of that was that our children continued to recreate with us right up until the time they left home. They never got tired of mom and dad, never got tired of interacting with us because we made a commitment to them. Love is 
time for our children. Amen. And it says we need to give that time. We also need to give sympathy. And I think we are sympathetic to a degree, but we have, not to, enabling. We have to be careful we're not indulging, but we're sympathetic. And so being sympathy means we understand their disappointments. Do children have disappointments? Yes. Yeah. And to us, they seem, that is so petty. But in their world, it's as big as some of our disappointments in our adult life. So we have to be understanding of that and honestly entering in with them and understanding their disappointments, but not indulging them in their ways. And so one of the things that we found so important in this um, as we were growing is that one of the things we planned to do as a family as our children got older that they had a passion they wanted to do they would do a family mission trip and I think that's a great idea and there's uh, Maranatha and other people out there that organize mission trips they have ones for families I think that's a great opportunity for binding and self and serving others and letting your children see other cultures and let them appreciate what they have here in this country back at home and so we had this big mission trip plan. We were going to go to an orphanage and serve there. And my husband's mother, uh, had her breast cancer reoccurred, and it came on with vengeance, and it, it went very quick. And we recognized that her health was so poor and so fragile that if we left the country to do this mission trip, we may not come back to Grandma, at least alive. So we talked to our children, they're all in their teen years. We said, look, this is the situation. We know, and we've got this trip planned, but we want you to know that grandma's health is very on the brink. And so what do you think would be the best thing to do? And they all said, without a hesitation, we need to take that time and go spend it with grandma. We don't need to go on a mission trip. And you know, our family never did a full mission trip together. But we, we did that for Grandma. And that was so important for them and for her. And none of them regretted. Now, we've done mission outreach, and we've been in uh, foreign countries where some of them have been. Actually, we've been in the Philippines and other places in Eastern Europe. And They would be considered mission, mission trips. trips. We just didn't view them that yeah, way. Yeah, <laughs> because for us, they're ministry mission trips. And this was just, we aren't doing ministry. We're just going to get in there and do the other kind. But it was so meaningful to them. And we said, we understand the disappointment, but we are so proud of you for making a decision that goes beyond what you want to do to what you really want to do, right? What's the best option? And the last area we want to talk about is encouragement. It's very important and it's a very typical to see the flaws and mistakes that our children make, okay? It's just, it's like, hey, I've told you, <laughs> I told you a hundred times, you know, why aren't you getting this? But it's not so natural for us to encourage every good decision that they make. We made a commitment to each other and to the Lord that we were going to focus on encouraging the good that we saw in our children as we were cultivating these things. As we were giving back to them, we needed to give back encouragement to them. And I can just tell you that the more you give encouragement, for the things they're doing right, the less desire they have to do the things that are wrong. Absolutely. God does the same thing with us. He does not treat us as we deserve, or none of us would be here, okay? He treats us for what he sees in us, what he can do in us, and what he looks forward to in the travail of his soul, that we are united with him. We need to focus on the good and encourage the good to encourage our young people. So we have a scripture we want to read here. It's found in Isaiah 28, 10. It says, for precept must be upon precept. That's the instruction upon instruction, right? And precept upon precept. Notice how many times it's repeated. Precept upon precept, precept upon precept, line upon line, line upon line, here little, there little. This is the realm of parenting. It's not all a heavy dose and, you're, and it's a perfect home. 
This is, this is something that we work with in, in our families that happens on a daily basis, here a little, there a little, the precept and another precept, a line upon a line, and then we evaluate how it's going in the home. Ask the children, how do you think home is going? Do you think it's a happy place? What can we do to improve? We ask them those questions. They give us feedback. And it, it's just amazing to see when we follow in God's ways, he does amazing things. And we want to leave you with two words at the close of this message that we think are very important. They were very important to us. We encouraged each other with these two words. The first one is consistency. One of the biggest problems we have as parents, we as parents, we're right there with you, was being consistent. If you can be consistent for a week, you can change your child's direction for life. Being consistent is very difficult. And the second word is perseverance. Let us not be weary in well-doing, for in due season, we shall reap if we faint not. Persevering through the things that are difficult pay off amazing dividends. Mm -hmm. you end there? I lost track of time. Are we supposed to be done now? We are we're done because we need a break before the next meeting at 3.15. Okay, so we're going to be done there. <laughs> so let's stand up and take a little break as we pray together. And then we'll, get, we'll have a break for the restroom and the drinks. Anything else you want to share? No. Okay. Then let's pray together, stretch, and we'll come back in 315. Father in heaven, we thank you for the privilege of parenting. We thank you for your perseverance with us. We thank you for encouraging us as parents, and we pray that we will pass that on to our children, that we will take these principles that we've talked about today and that you will embed those into each of our hearts in a way that will make a difference in our families. And that we will not weary in well-doing, that we will continue on and that we will see the fruit of righteousness by your grace. Through Jesus Christ we pray, amen.